Hello and welcome to the Samson Historical Study on this chilly December afternoon. I'm your host, Abby Sampson. I am so very excited to be here with you uh, to talk about something that would have happened this week in history. Uh, first, I'd like to say you can see us here every first and third Friday, or first and third Wednesday, rather, uh, of the month, and we are bringing you all kinds of really wonderful 18th century historical information. I want to say thank you all. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know we did, and our staff is really, really excited for all the people we got to talk to on Cyber Monday um, and all of your, your wonderful feedback. So thank you so much for that. Um, if you have not checked out our uh, Peyton video where we did a butter in the butter churn, um, you should definitely check that out. That's a really fun family activity, and it was something really cool to have at our Thanksgiving dinner, and I think we're going to repeat it for Christmas. So if you're looking for something to do um, as a family, check out that video. It did not take as much time as we thought it would, and it was really enjoyable. So what we're going to talk about today I might seem a little odd. So we are going to talk about the Boston Massacre. Now, you might be thinking, that didn't happen this week in history. It happened in March. And you're correct. Uh, but it, the verdict from the trials was handed down on December 5th. So that would have been just a few days ago, but in 1770. And so we all learned about the Boston Massacre in school as a major inciting incident for the American Revolution. And we probably saw this image we're going to pull up right here. Uh, it's an image by Paul Revere. And it, this, is, this is something most Americans can identify. Uh, ironically, this was likely paid, plagiarized by Revere uh, from a gentleman named Pelham. And if you look, take the time to look up, there's a lot of articles about that. Uh, you Give me your opinion. Uh, I know what mine is, but let me know what you think in the comments after you look those two things up. Uh, so again, this is known as one of the kind of major inciting incidents uh, leading up to the revolution. Uh, we go back to 1767, really briefly, uh, with the Townsend Acts, Again, no taxation without representation. You have lead, tea, all these kinds of goods uh, being taxed for the colonists. And uh, they, they revolt. They say that's not fair, which, you know, becomes the founding kind of principle uh, of the war in this country. So as a result of these uprisings that are coming after the Townsend Acts, the Massachusetts governor, Francis Bernard, uh, petitions the king for extra assistance in collecting and protecting those taxes. He agrees and sends over additional English troops. And so October 1768, two regiments of British soldiers, the 14th and the 29th regiments, arrive in Boston to ensure that these taxes are again collected and protected. That's roughly 4,000 British soldiers. Uh, so Boston was already kind of this hotbed of, of radical movements and things like that happening. Uh, so then you put a, you throw you know, 4,000 soldiers that are now being housed and quartered in people's homes, and that becomes an issue. Uh, though not all 4,000 are being quartered in people's homes, but enough that you know, people are already upset, and that becomes a you know, major part of our, our laws and rights in this country. And so in late February of 1770, a British sympathizer fires into a crowd and shoots and kills 11-year-old Christopher Cedar. We're going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of that here in just a minute, uh, of why that person fired, that kind of thing. Um, but this uh, became a, a huge, huge kind of news day, essentially, all over. And over 2,000 mourners, that's one-seventh of Boston's entire population, showed up uh, at the funeral of 11-year-old Christopher Cedar. And a lot of that was encouraged by the Sons of Liberty, um, Samuel Adams specifically, though he's not the main Adams we're going to talk about today. So shortly after that, on March 5th in 1770, just after 9 o'clock uh, on King Street, a single British soldier, Private White, is guarding the Boston's Custom House. So he's standing out there doing his patrol, and he overhears... Uh, a wig maker's apprentice, uh, mentioned that Captain John Goldfinch had not paid a bill to a local wig maker, which ironically find, we find out that he did in fact pay that bill. And 
truthfully, you know, speculation, but it's, it's young boys trying to rile up this other young boy who's guarding the customs house. Honor's a big issue, especially in the 18th century. So you have um, Private White, he was saying he did pay, he's a gentleman, and he, if he hasn't, he will. Edward Garrick, the apprentice, retorts that there are no gentlemen left in the regiment, and Private White and Garrick exchange some words back and forth. White hits Garrick with the butt of his musket, and that causes Garrick to fall to the ground. This whole commotion drew kind of passerbys, and they've got about 50 people that have joined a crowd outside the custom house surrounding Private Hugh White. So as these people start to turn out, um, the church bells start to ring. And what that means is that somebody is signaling people to come out of their homes, come out of where they are, they are to the town center where this customs house is. Somebody is drawing a crowd that turns out to be about three to 400 people surrounding uh, Private Hugh Garrick. I'm sorry, Hugh White, rather. And at this time, um, his captain, Thomas Preston, uh, was inside in the main guard, and for about 30 minutes, this is already starting to, to build and build and build, and he's deciding, do I call in other troops? Because he is outnumbered, and he doesn't want to put people at risk. And that's what's going to happen. He's trying to figure out, is this going to take this and de-escalate, or is it going to escalate this situation? He decides, yes, we do need assistance here. So seven British soldiers from the 29th Regiment, a corporal and six other privates, come to join White with fixed bayonets and their muskets, accompanied by their captain who carries only a sword. Uh, and that, that drawn sword is given commands. It is menacing, that, that sort of thing. The crowd continues to taunt the British soldiers with names and profanities. Uh, then they start throwing things. Uh, you hear in one person's testimony that they're throwing snowballs. That's true. However, they're also throwing ice and sticks and rocks and oyster shells and all of these different things at these seven boys and their captain, their leader. And so uh, one of the soldiers, Hugh Montgomery, was pushed to the ground and clubbed in the head uh, and received a pretty, pretty hefty blow. And there's some speculation on whether... When he hit the ground, his musket he discharged accidentally or whether he fired on purpose. There's also speculation on whether he himself shouted fire or not. And that's all detailed in the different witness testimonies in the court case. So there's, there's a lot going on here. People are throwing things. People are shouting. Regardless, a gunshot goes off. The others open fire. Now, three men were killed instantly, and two died of wounds later. That is in addition to six who were wounded and not killed. Here we have uh, a monument to the people killed during the Boston Massacre. Uh, there's five victims, Crispus Attucks, James Caldwell, Patrick Carr, Samuel Gray, and Samuel Maverick. Um, also here is the 11-year-old the uh, Mr. Cedar who is, who is interred as well. Uh, Crispus Attucks is a name that you probably know. He was a freed sailor and of uh, African and Native American descent and became a martyr of the American Revolution. So the crowd does disperse after this at the urging of Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Um, he's promising them an inquiry, urging them um, to calm down and let the law handle it. Uh, the quote is, the law, let the law have its course. I will live and die by the law. So within two days, the eight soldiers their, and their captain, Thomas Preston, along with four civilians, were arrested and charged with murder. Um, sworn depositions were received almost immediately uh, in what would be known and called the Bloody Massacre, uh, a lot and thanks to Mr. Pelham and then Mr. Revere. And Hutchison postpones the trials to later in the year. And this is to allow tensions to cool. He doesn't want to create another riot outside of the courthouse and whatever the verdict happens. So he says, we're going to hold off. Now, there are over 200 eyewitness accounts of this event, and they vary widely. Uh, they 
it, the people in general, kind of as a unit, agree to a fair trial. Um, a lot of it is out of that, for them, is out of sense of, of duty and respect for law, but a lot of it's also for fear of retribution from England. So no matter what happens, at least they can say they were given a fair trial. Uh, the Captain Preston was tried separately as an officer and a gentleman. So he was tried on his own. Um, there was another set for the soldiers and a third for the customs officers who supposedly shot from uh, one of the windows, but that was, that never came to pass. That was completely false. The customs officers never shot from the windows. Uh, Captain Preston submitted a letter to the Boston Gazette in March uh, 12th of 1770, so just a few days later. And it was really early on in his imprisonment, it, which lasted seven months, which was a long time in, in this day and age for an expedient trial. And so he thanked the Bostonians, and I'm going to read a section of that letter that was published in the Boston Gazette. Permit me through the channel of your paper to return my thanks in the most public manner to the inhabitants in general of this town, who, throwing aside all party and prejudice, have with the utmost humanity and freedom stepped forth for advocates of the truth in defense of my injured innocence in the late unhappy affair that happened on Monday night last. And to assure them that I shall ever have the highest sense of the justice they have done me, which will ever gratefully be remembered by their much obliged and most obedient humble servant, Thomas Preston. That was received pretty well. Um, a later letter that he wrote in the summer after being uh, being in prison for a while, he wrote a letter that was intercepted on its way to London. It expressed his frustration saying that the Bostonians were willing to come up with any lie to condemn him and his soldiers. Granted, he's probably experiencing some frustration during this imprisonment. Um, and that ended up in the paper of June 1770. That was not, not quite as well received. Didn't do much for his public public figure. Uh, the British troops were recalled from Boston, but this damage had already been done. And so um, that March 5th had already intensified the British sentiment so far, the anti-British sentiment so far uh, that it was pretty much irreparable. And with these going to court, uh, they need lawyers. Captain Preston, the soldiers, they have to have a legal defense. You can't defend yourself in this era. And so we entered John Adams. Many refused to represent the British as they would be risking not only their careers, but their lives as well. John Adams, a lawyer of 35, agreed uh, to defend the Redcoats. Even though Hutchinson waited more than six months until the trial, tensions were still very high in the two trials, uh, Rex versus Preston and Rex versus uh, Williams, uh, I'm sorry, Wams and others. Uh, they began in the late fall of 1770. And first we're going to talk about the trial of, uh, by Captain Preston. Uh, it lasted from October 24th to October 29th here at the courthouse. And it was quite long for a criminal trial in that era. And the jurors were sequestered from family and friends. And these jurors, none of them were Bostonians. So there was a, a true effort to have this impartial jury um, and Adams was joined by Josiah Quincy Jr. and Robert Akhmadi. And so I'm going to talk about um, Josiah Quincy Jr. for just a second because this guy could be his own video. Adams really gets the spotlight in this, but I don't think he's the only one who deserves it. So he was appointed by the courts to defend the only person likely less popular than the British soldiers, and that's Ebenezer Richardson. And he is the, the man who um, fired into the crowd and killed the 11-year-old Christopher Cedar. He was charged with murder, and the reason that he shot into the crowd, the crowd was surrounding his house, throwing bricks and rocks at his home. It struck his wife. He fired his gun indiscriminately into the crowd. He was convicted of murder uh, for essentially his negligence, and just he didn't care that who he hit, and so that's why he was convicted. However, uh, Josiah Quincy decided that it was more important to have a fair trial regardless of his beliefs of the morality of the defendant, so he did represent both. He also had an argument with his father uh, regarding his defense of the British soldiers, and I have a letter that he wrote 
uh, a portion of a letter that he wrote to his father. It says, This and much more might be told with great truth, and I dare affirm that you and this whole people will one day rejoice that I became an advocate for the aforesaid criminals charged with murder of our fellow citizens. I never harbored the expectation, nor any great desire, that all men should speak well of me. To inquire my duty and to do it is my aim. Being mortal, I am subject to error and conscious of this. I wish to be diffident. Being a rational creature, I judge for myself according to the light afforded me. When a plan conducted is formed with an honest deliberation, neither murmuring, slander, nor reproaches move. For my single self, I consider judge, and with a reason hope to be immutable. There are honest men in all sects, and I wish their approbation. There are wicked bigots in all parties, and I abhor them. And I think that is a remarkable take on, on the law as it should be. His goal is to defend honesty, defend truth, and let the facts speak for themselves. One of the reasons that his father may have been a little more uh, apt and argumentative on his, his defending the British soldiers, uh, the opposition was led by Samuel Quincy. That would be Josiah Quincy's older brother. And then also a classmate of John Adams. So you have this, they all know each other. So they're related to each other, and they're defending complete opposite sides. Now, Samuel Quincy is a staunch loyalist, so much so, so that after the war, he flees the country and doesn't return. And he's also joined by Robert Treat Payne, who's a member of the Sons of Liberty, and Jonathan Sewell, Mass Attor Massachusetts Attorney General, should have been there, uh, but he flees the colony altogether and comes back after the trial is settled. So he's not really a hero here. Um, but I think it's really interesting that the defense is led by the, a loyalist and a member of the Sons of Liberty. And just as you know, everybody here is really focused on truth and law in the matter. And I think that that's commendable as one of the earliest, biggest court cases in our nation's history. So even though Thomas Preston had only drawn, drawn a sword, uh, he didn't carry a firearm as the commanding officer, he was charged with murder because his men fired. And he was charged with giving that command that they were to fire. And so uh, English custom prohibited him to take the stand uh, to defend him and to defend himself in criminal cases because the supposition was that, th that someone would naturally perjure themselves. He was allowed to answer questions when he was given them, but he could not act as his own defense. Um, in an eyewitness account, Preston insisted that he did not order the men to fire and instead told them to stop firing and hold their fire. Uh, the case went to jury at 5 p.m. on October 29th. A verdict was reached three hours later uh, but that was not announced until the next day on October 30th. Preston was found not guilty because it could not be proven that he had given the order to fire. And there's unfortunately no transcript left that we could find of his trial specifically, but there are at least three different eyewitness accounts of the proceedings in the courtroom to go on and from, from separate observers. So Preston is found not guilty, free and clear. He goes back to England. He retires from the army altogether uh, and lives out the rest of his days in relative peace from what we know. Then we lead to the trial of the eight soldiers. Again, this is a huge spectacle. Here's a pamphlet that was um, published in regarding the trial as people want to keep up on the news. So defending Preston was challenging on its own, but now Adams faced even more of a challenge when preparing the defense of these eight soldiers because it's, Preston's not guilty. There's no way, he can't, bl they can't blame it on him. It comes down to these eight men themselves. So the trial of the soldiers ran from November 27th, 1770, until a decision was reached on December 5th. Which brings us to this week in history. But those soldiers' names are Corporal William Wems, James Hardigan, William McCauley, Hugh White, Matthew Kilroy, William Warren, John Carroll, and Hugh Montgomery. Adam again is joined by Josiah Quincy and a new lawyer, Samson Flowers. 
Similar to the trial of, of Captain Preston, the jury was sequestered the entire time and it was not made up of Bostonians. So that emphasis on finding an impartial jury. During this trial, 80 witnesses testified and John Adams gave some of the best legal defense of his entire career. Now you can actually find Adams' notes um, at the Boston, Massachusetts Historical Society website. Uh, there are tons and tons and tons of his notes on witnesses, why he's calling them, what he highlights, and that's really interesting to read through if you have some time. Um, Adams did not have the neatest handwriting, but once you get it, it's pretty easy. Um, but because of the, again, because of Preston's innocence or not guilty, he now has to figure out how to defend these soldiers. And so he actually began his closing speech with a, a specific quote. And I want to read that now before we go into kind of how he defended the soldiers, because I think it's something worth mentioning. And it actually becomes kind of a very you know, famous part of, of him and his legacy. If by supporting the rights of mankind and of invincible truth, I shall contribute to save from the agonies of death one unfortunate victim of tyranny or of ignorance, equally fatal. His blessings and years of transport will be sufficient consolation to me for the contempt of all mankind. Adams knew that this was not going to make him a popular man, but he did it anyway because he believed it was right. It was more important to save an innocent person than to condemn a guilty one. And Adams believed that through close examination of the facts and statements that the soldiers were not at fault. Here we actually have a piece of evidence and it was the crime scene drawing, which was drawn by Paul Revere. So I, personally, I find that incredibly problematic when you look at Paul Revere is already rebel rousing. He's already, you know, got propaganda going on and you can see the bodies of the fallen are drawn in detail. If you look the small circles with lines coming out of them, that would be these seven soldiers that are being surrounded and having things thrown at them. So um, I, I don't know that this would hold up today as a non-bias rendering or piece of evidence, uh, but it is, it is interesting to have. So thank you, Mr. Revere, for that. But Adams contends that if anyone's to blame, it's the British government. They're sending these soldiers over here. Soldiers are sent to do their duty. Uh, these men are, are put into this situation and it's the British government. They created the problem. They were, they're why we were angry. And then they sent these people over here to do their dirty work, which had some merit. Uh, so then he moves into the issue of the firing of the weapons. And he stresses that the soldiers were acting in self-defense, that any reasonable man can understand that they're acting in self-defense. They were mistrusted. Adams queried the jury asking how the soldiers could be expected to remain stoic as a crowd is throwing things and moving and pressing in on them. It was evident from one of the accounts, uh, the crowds were getting exceedingly more violent. And in that case, wouldn't any person want to defend themselves? Which I think is, it, it does have merit. And so through his speech, Adam stressed the evidence of that all the witnesses was not sufficient to convict any one of the eight soldiers of murder. Even in the case of the two who were supposed to have been proven to kill, to have killed, um, to have killed people specifically, um, the evidence demanded that the charge be reduced to manslaughter because there was not malice aforethought. Their intention was not to go there that day and kill those protesters. So in the midst of this eloquent speech that Adams is delivering, um, he delivers one of his most famous quotations. And let me know if you've heard this one before. Uh, Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictums of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. So as someone sympathetic to the Patriot cause, as Adams was, um, this is a reminder from him to him and to everybody around him that facts are separate from your personal opinions. Does he want the British soldiers there? No, but 
or is he going to convict men as a symbol of that? Also, no, based on facts. So the trial of soldiers is also unique as it accepted hearsay as evidence. And one of the five victims, Patrick Carr, he was one, as we read earlier, did die from his wounds received. And he testified on his deathbed that he believed the soldiers were acting in self-defense. Now, in the 18th century and, and earlier, you have this, this belief that deathbed confessions are by nature true. So uh, the physician that treated Carr was allowed to testify on Carr's behalf and give those words. So the jury deliberated two and a half hours in the case of the soldiers. Six were acquitted and two were charged with manslaughter. Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy. Both opted for benefit of the clergy. Now, that is an entire rabbit hole you can go down, benefit of the clergy. Obviously, these are not clergymen. They're not part of the church. Uh, but it was a way that by this point, late 18th century, uh, if you were a first-time offender, there was a lesser punishment aside from you know, death, hanging, that kind of thing. So you can opt for benefit of the clergy. It's only good once. Not once for each type of crime. It's good once. Um, and the offenders were then branded with an M on this part of their hand here, so that if they ever had to, um, to swear and testify an oath in court, it would be obvious that they'd received benefit of the clergy prior. Now, I do definitely urge you to look into that. Uh, it's really interesting. It's very, very old laws that allowed clergymen um, certain types of clemencies in the church, and then later became people who were able to read you find out the phrase neck verse, which is where prisoners are asked to read uh, 51st Psalm uh, to prove that they are, can, are clergy or, and can take, take the benefit of the clergy. Um, so you have people memorizing the specific verse in Latin. That is a whole thing. At this point, they don't have to be literate. It's simply, it's simply a way to kind of commute to a lesser sentence or lesser punishment for a first-time offender. And it was not available for all charges. If they'd been charged with murder, it would not have been available to them. So the aftermath of this. Not everybody was happy, obviously. They didn't, a lot of people didn't get what they felt like was justice. And so the Boston Gazette railed against John Adams. And he lost half his practice, which is, he, he states himself and is also noted by a, a kind of a more non-biased party that, his practice did suffer significantly. But what do the December 1770s trials mean for us today as a country? And I think that there's a real honest indication here of that allowing the law and the justice and that you know, law is reason free from passion kind of thing, allowing that to truly take place. And also, you have the colonies that are rebelling against a tyrannical government. And I can't believe that it's entirely lost that they themselves were acting in a way to not continue their own form of a tyrannical government and just dish out punishment. They had a respect and a belief in this law. Whether at the end of the trials they still felt that way, I don't know. Um, but some obviously did. This also set up self-defense um, a little more firmly as a legal defense in the colonies specifically. And it was one of the first times the phrase reasonable doubt had been used in, in a colonial court. You know, do you, you have these different people? Well, did you know that he fired without a reasonable doubt? Are you a reasonable person? Would a reasonable man think this? So on the third anniversary of the Boston Massacre, March 5th, 1773, before the infamous Tea Party in December, Adams reflected on his decision to accept the responsibility in defending the British soldiers and their captain. And he wrote this passage and it was something that shows that it didn't just affect him, it affected his family. I devoted myself to endless labor and anxiety, if not to infamy and death, and that for nothing except what was indeed was and ought to be in all, a sense of duty. 
In the evening, expressed to Mrs. Adams all my apprehensions. The excellent lady, who has always encouraged me, burst into a flood of tears, but said she was very sensible of all the danger to her and our children as well as to me. But she thought I had done as I ought, and she was very willing to share in all that was to come and place her trust in Providence. John and Abigail are very well known for their letters back and forth, and Abigail's well known uh, for her political mind and, represent and representation of, you know, of women and, and such. And so she, again, comes up to say, I support in what I believe is right. It's that belief in the law, and they can't be the only two. So Adam also expected anyone should and do the same thing. He didn't believe that this was this unique you know, thing that he should be held up, held up and admired for. He's saying anybody should do this. The judgment of death against those soldiers would have been as foul a stain upon this country as the executions of the Quakers or witches anciently. As the evidence was, the verdict of the jury was exactly right. So, in, in summation, that the Boston Massacre, that event that we all know, that we learn about in school as this one moment, this 30 minutes in history, is still so relevant in building the legal system we have today. And it went on so much further in, in justice in the colonies. And I personally have always found that this story is remarkable and interesting because it shows a foundation with all these different players who are not necessarily defending somebody because they believe that person, but because they believe in the law on either side. So if you have anything interesting that's to go with um, any of this, please let me know. If you have questions, let me know, and I will do my best uh, to answer them or to, to give you those resources. But thank you so much for being here with me today and for exploring this remarkable story involving the founding of our country and our legal system. Thanks so much and have a wonderful rest of your week.